from a practice standpoint, it then shapes how we approach, let's say even a class, because ultimately we want people to shift to that style of learning. And if we're always showing them everything, then they never find it through their own experience. One, two, three. So, yeah, and I don't, I don't know if you know the story. I was thinking before uh, I got here, there's probably a lot I don't know about <laughs> this story, yeah, yeah. right? So the movement standard, well, it's been six years now. Um, and I get this question a lot. It's actually, it's actually come up on podcasts often, and I'll talk about you guys. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> well, so I, shout I out to cool. – Shout yeah. out, yeah. <laughs> um, so – at the time, so I had a studio before in Dallas called the Movement Dallas, and there was this period in between, let's say, I can't even remember the years, let's say 2010 and 2014, where I was kind of a nomad. Mm -hmm. And knowing Dean, knowing you, knowing uh, your brother, it, it just, you know, it's like, hey, you know, these guys may have some sort of opportunity. You guys had that gem on Henderson. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure that place out and, you know, how can this work for classes, et cetera. And, man, I remember that gym was hot, too. No AC. Oh, yeah. I think it did have a heater. Yes. But in the middle yes. of summer, man, whew, it was hot. Um, but I was, <laughs> I was grateful because I had another gym I was training clients out of. And I needed a space to start to explore some of these other ideas. I had started working with Ido, um, and there were people that were interested in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted a space of my own, but it was in this in-between time. So I reached out to, I think it was Dean maybe, and I asked him about space use. And you guys also, I don't know if you remember, but I used to come train at Vondren. Oh, yeah. And so... In my phone, you're still um, Gymnastics Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was doing a lot that more time. gymnastic then. Yeah. Uh, so this was 2014. So then I started this little local group called Movement Meetup. And again, I get this question all the time. How do I start a community? And for me, it was when Facebook was doing meetups regularly. So I, I kind of started this little group and people started showing up outside and I needed a space. So we had the two o'clock slot at the Henderson gym uh -huh. on a Saturday, which in the summer, you know, it got pretty warm. Um, but that, that's I was, how you create a community is just do something so unappealing. You yeah, know, it's exactly. Like if that, shows yeah, up, you if know someone shows in. up, they're in. <laughs> so we started getting, um, you know, be five people, then 10 people, then 20 people. Um, and you know, again, like that was a once a Saturday class or once a week Saturday class mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had the space of the opportunity to, to do without that. Yeah. So, um, how long did we we probably did that for about four or five months yeah and i remember going to some myself yeah and the things that stuck out to me uh was there was always an inclusion of something that felt really novel it felt i don't even know how to describe it but it, it felt it felt like we weren't trying to put it in some container of fitness, but it was just a, it was an aspect of like moving your body that you couldn't say like, oh, well, this is clearly for flexibility or this is clearly for balance and agility. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I always thought it was really novel. And it, and, and likely some familiarity as well. Mm -hmm. Like there were some, some similar ideas, maybe patterns. Yeah. But I also, I still don't know what I don't know. Um, but then, you know, it's interesting to see the look, looking back, um, and to see this thing evolve and what, what it is now kind of like we've, we've talked about previously, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I gratitude for mm. that opportunity. Cause I, you know, again, just to even have the outlet at the time, like there wasn't another place I could go and use gymnastic rings. Yeah. Unless I went to the park and just hung them on a tree, which mm -hmm. I did occasionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, to be around other people, you know, and yeah. to, to explore that. So thank you. Cheers to that, man. <laughs> Cheers to that. Six years later. Yeah. Man, six years later, you're a you're a salty veteran of uh, owning your own business and and the ups and downs in that little meetup. What do you what do you miss about that? Because there were there were times in my own story 
where I have this really great sense of nostalgia for how we started and like some of the bare bones, like not not worrying about the woes of of owning and running a business. Like, yeah. what do you miss about that time? You know, we're I'm always trying to get back there in a way. Mm. Um, I miss mostly practicing with the community. Mm. So it's a uh, it, the the group cra- uh, practice element is what drew me in because. You know, I was doing my thing, and I felt like an odd man out in some ways. I'm like, I'm doing this thing. It it it, it seems kind of weird, and you know, it gets a lot of questions. But come try it. Mm-hmm. And as people got into it, and there were people to practice with, that's what really drew me to creating the movement standard. It was more about this hybridization of getting some personal work in for the individual, but also this community element. Mm-hmm. Versus like, hey, let's create a situation where we can run a bunch of classes. And so I'm always trying to get back to that. Yeah. So how do I continue to, again, show up for my own practice? But I, I've i always wanted a, a, a group that I can dialogue with and that also can push me in my own practice as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's tough. It's yeah. tough. And so now you fast forward to today, has that had to separate because you have to facilitate what's what's happening in the structure of the business? And then, you know, for you yourself, it's not as much um, you participating at the same time. Yeah, there's some of that. Um, as my practice has grown a little esoteric, like what what can happen is as development happens, things start to kind of splinter Mm -hmm. and people have their own directions. Um, And then there's still some cohesiveness in that. Like there's still some general principles or concepts that we share, but the work becomes um, different. Mm -hmm. Um, So we still share space. We're doing different things. Um, And then, yeah, it can be challenging to maintain that with the structure of running a business. Yeah. And, as I'm sure you've also seen, there are generations to people coming in the space. So you still you have Gen One, that there are still some people there, and then Gen Two starts to come in, Gen Three starts to come in, where there are these different groups that are really starting from scratch again. Mm-hmm. And so that that has its benefits both as a teacher and a practitioner, because I can go back and like refresh my own and practice with these people as they're building their their skill sets. Um, but you can only do so much of that, Mm -hmm. you know, as you're also exploring your own boundaries. So yeah, it, it's, it's a con, it's like a weekly thing that I consider and, and attempt at. Um, but as a matter of fact, we're just now going back to kind of an old setup that allows for more of that personal practice inside of a group. Interesting. Yeah. How is that? How is that going to go down? Um, so that is essentially like we have a core program for those that won't, don't want to get any sort of individualized program, and then we have set times where we all meet and we go through whatever our individual practices that is in some ways organized around a specific uh, concept. Let's say strength, upper uh-huh. body strength. Well, you're doing your upper body strength work while so and so is doing theirs. If you don't have specific work for you, we have a general program that you can follow as well. Uh-huh. So there's still coaching in the class, mm-hmm. um, but it's moving people more towards autonomy within yeah. the container of a group practice. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah. and as far as um, leading them, empowering them to have that autonomy, at some point I imagine you you have created structure and they know – uh, potentially like where their their limitations are. Correct. It's like, hey, what I need is different than what you need. And right. so there's there's some education, there's some teaching along the way, but then at some point they know the trajectory that they're on and your job is just to to observe, provide feedback, gently guide and nudge in the right direction. Yeah. But it's not it's not to say, hey, you're you're a sheep, I'm the sheep herder, you know, like you don't exactly. know what to do until I tell you to. Is exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And it's um, that's part of the self learning I- idea, right? It's like our our ideally like our we we call it a movement school now because ideally this the scenario is, hmm. 
the learning aspect involves self understanding, not external guidance only. Mm. And that can be tough because culturally we've been led <laughs> and it's still good to have some, some leading, so to speak, or some guidance, but we're trying to like bridge that gap of, um, of, of learning. And, and this idea of learning, this is something that a friend of mine and teacher that came in even uh, two weeks ago talked about. Um, learning is not necessarily just the accumulation side of things. So typically we think of learning as I've accumulated all these skills and this knowledge. I've got, you know, all my books that I've read, et cetera, my mm-hmm. diploma, all the things that show my learning, but it's distinctly different from non-accumulated learning, which is more so rooted in, we could say, attention and presence. And in that case, that starts to shift the quantity of accumulation, which we would typically call learning, um, to a learning that is more centered in the qualitative side Hmm. of how I approach something. And it took me a long time to also recognize that this is the that old saying, um, don't let school get in the way of your education because ultimately education we like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Edu- education is, um, it's, it's, it's inward. It's a self thing. It's not an external thing. Granted, these external things can guide me, but they're not, um, in and of themselves, they're only images, they're concepts. They're not actually teaching me anything if I'm not practicing them mm-hmm. or if I'm not understanding myself. Mm-hmm. So, from a practice standpoint, it then shapes how we approach, let's say, even a class, because ultimately we want people to shift to that style of learning. And if we're always showing them everything, then they never find it through their own experience. So this is it's kind of a meta principle for life. But um, yeah, that's good. Applying it to practice, I think it it makes sense. Yeah. So I imagine, and you know, there's at some point we're gonna have to be like. Hey, this is this is who you are, and you know who is Edo nah. and, and all this stuff. But I'm more interested to know how do you? I'm sure that's like revolutionary to most of the. Maybe not. Maybe maybe a lot of people come in, and I remember in the early days, like I didn't have to explain anything because they had already educated themselves mm-hmm. as to you know this countercultural thing that we were doing at the time. Sure. And so maybe that's the case for you. But I've trained with you. I've seen the the demographic isn't isn't one particular avatar, mm-hmm. and so I'm sure there is some education. There's some reprogramming that has to happen. How do you go about that? Because we're we're quantitative, especially in fitness, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, you know, what is this saying? What is what's my heart? You know, how do right, I? Right. What's my PR? How do I progress? And you're you're postulating something that doesn't have to do with a lot of external validation i assume sure so what's that process yeah well first thing i would say is yeah there definitely in the earlier days people were generally um filtered you could say in a way that um by the time they showed up they understood what it was that we were doing yeah as things hit more of the mainstream which i wouldn't even say this is mainstream but as things hit more of a of a larger demographic there's more education needed because, you know, people see something, they're not really quite sure what it is, but they've heard that they should do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that process ends up being different depending on who comes in and what they present within their own practice. So for example, if someone comes to me and I can tell that they spend a lot of time in their intellectual capacity, then we need to get them into their body. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if someone comes in and they're, which is more rare, but they're just in their sensing body and they're not using any of this, then we need to give them opportunity and maybe some direction into more understanding, knowledge. Mm-hmm. So some of it is then meeting the student where they are and providing opportunities as a whole, which can be tough as a community yeah. to provide opportunities as a whole for you know the development of everybody. Um, but yeah, I would say there's no, I, I haven't found any one size fits all, but it's it's trying to match not only the theoretical, conceptual, what we're talking about, but also with the practice. So mm-hmm. for example, if somebody um, 
if somebody doesn't spend a lot of time using their, let's say, cognitive function, then maybe giving them object work or coordination work, things that are going to challenge their their thinking capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, on the sensing side, giving giving uh, skills or giving practices that allow people to actually better inform sensing into their body. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, but no, it's good. I mean, I, I'm I got a, a hundred questions from that, and so to to try to summarize what you said, it means that one, you have to know who it is that you're dealing with, right? For lack of a better term, there has to be some type of investigation, deduction, assessment to know, hey, where where is this person's strength, and then therefore what is their tendency. And then, therefore, what would they really benefit as as a complement to that? Right. Yeah. And then you have to have the wherewithal as a coach and a facilitator to know. Now that means this. This is this group of exercises, this type of modalities that that would really serve you well. And then from there, you have to let them do it. Probably let them fail because they're not going to be great at yep. it. And then try to almost hint at the the story or the narrative that you want them to feel by having done that because without it i'm sure that they would feel like a doofus yeah and when and i've heard you say this um learning to be um learning to be okay with not being good yeah is a it's a big it's a big uh aspect of even coming into the to the space to work with us on the whole, in terms of practice, it's, I would say, balanced in many ways across these different faculties to where if you come to any one class, you're going to get some of each. And then through that, you figure out quickly which ones you're not, quote unquote, good at. And arguably, that's then the directive for where to spend most Mm. of your time. Um, So let's say, again, I do some coordination work and I'm fumbly. The human tendency is is to move away from that thing. Yeah. Um, because there's resistance there. We know that like the neurophysiological things that are happening there, there's a tendency to walk away from that and the psychological aspect of it. Um, but if we can reframe it as saying like, hey, look, this is something that if you move in this direction is going to push you more towards your capabilities and your potentials, it's going to actually round out the other aspects of your practices and your life then it becomes something that has some sort of meaning behind it where it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I can start to show up not only maybe in the confinement of practice, but also in life to things that I'm not naturally good at. So, you know, there's a, again, this could get into a million different kind of fragments, but like go. one of those is specialty versus generality. And this practice is definitely a generalist mindset where, you know, if I, if I take a, conceptual image of a specialist as being like um, if I start with a circle and that circle gets pulled in one direction, well, it gets kind of distorted. And that distortion, the other end of that distortion is my specialty. If I take that circle, but I'm working on all angles of the pulling, then that circle actually grows bigger and more of a whole Mm -hmm. kind of representation of we could say generality. It's not to say one is better than the other because we know we need specialty, but we could also say that from a movement perspective, most people aren't trying to specialize in one thing. They pick it out of maybe interest or um, maybe a desire to compete or, you know, let's say do a marathon or have some some event to like root them down and doing mm-hmm. something physical. But in terms of the development of self, because you know, we can't separate the physical body from who we are, the mind, et cetera. There is an opportunity in this fullness of non-specialty generality to better understand what we are. So Mm -hmm. if I'm moving into a direction that I'm not good at, it helps me dig into areas of myself that I might not clearly understand yet. And that could obviously, and will obviously be, um, on the level of psychology, physiology, all of the byproducts that come from meeting that, we could say, resistance. Mm. So, yeah, this distinction between, and many people have talked about specialty versus generality, but um, to actually have the practice represent that, 
um, again, it gives meaning behind doing things like mm. why would I why would I balance a stick? You know, um, it gives, like you said, the opportunity to share context mm -hmm. versus just like I'm doing this because I saw something cool on Instagram. Yeah. Um, so that that becomes represented in really most of the classes that we're exploring so that when someone comes in, they're not just getting a program. It's like, OK, we're going to go through this and it will take time to educate. But as we go through it, we're also going to do our best to share the context of why. Um, and I would say, again, most people, the why is how it in my experience working with people and myself the mm -hmm. why is a little easier because we come in through thought so it's like i can capture somebody with the why pretty easily to get them to actually sense in their body is much more difficult mm -hmm. so what does this actually feel like when you're doing this like you have this image of a handstand and you don't actually maybe even know why you want it but let's talk about why the handstand might be so valuable in the body like what does it feel like what are we what are the um the inherent principles that we're working here when mm -hmm. we're doing a handstand and how does this distill into something that can translate into other areas of practice so that's more again what we're trying to educate and attempt to educate and it and it gets shaped through these various what we call containers these areas of study yeah that's good you know, there's a there's a lot there, and we could go in lots of different directions. But one one thing I want to to comment, and one thing I've always admired, is I think when you get a ragtag group of of gym rats together, it's no different than forming a community around any other thing. And because we're social creatures, it's easy to say, okay, well, if I want to fit in here, then I gotta wear. Um, you know, I got to wear, you know, I got to have a mustache and I got to, you know, I got to have a collared shirt and tuck it into khaki shorts and I can't show up with shoes on because that's what everybody else here is doing. And it's been like that in our community, too. It's like, hey, I, I want to fit in here. And so naturally I need to figure out what are the things that I could assimilate to. But one of the things I like about what you're saying is the common bond at movement standard is this desire to expand what it is we're capable of doing. And what's nice, and I'm sure you appreciate this, but I'm going to say it just in case, you know, those that train with you don't really grasp like how awesome this is, is nobody has to be doing the same thing. Hmm. And it's very easy to take that desire to be a community and, and to create this social group to say, well, I got to be I got to be just like these people. And what you're saying is like, nah, man, the only thing that's bonded us together is that I'm on this trajectory for me. You're on that for you. And furthermore, and very specifically, you've included a lot of things that it's impossible to look cool doing. <laughs> right? <laughs> true. It's impossible yeah. to be like, I've, I've nailed this. Like yeah. I've perfected yeah. this. And so, Hey guys, look at me. I'm I'm the top dog. I've done this the best yeah. because it is so three dimensional. It is ground based, yeah. and there is so much um, uh, agility involved and balance. Where where it's like a, a very very you know delicate ledge that you're trying to balance on, and I think that's only um, further establishing this thing that you're talking about. Yeah, and one of the limitations I I, I found in you know, the way that we, you know, gravitated towards CrossFit is that it was not easy to be a specialist, but it was easy to be a good generalist. And what you're saying is it's it's actually pretty hard to be a good generalist. You know, we could get we could get pretty well established with these linear movements up and down and be like, hey, I got a pretty good air squat. Yeah. How great am I? And the more that I and I'm only on the the cusp and the outside, but when I think about all these things you're talking about. You know our our friend Bo, and to see how he's developed, like there's never been a specialty towards one thing. I know a handstand's really important to him, but it's not that he's forsaken everything else in the yeah, practice sure. to focus on that one particular thing. And uh, it sounds like that's a really intentional thing that you guys have done. But I think uh, it's easy for a community to turn into. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
kind of a mindless cult, you know, where yeah, everybody yeah. just is like, hey, I, I got to step in line. Yeah, yeah. I got to do this exactly like they do it. Yeah. And it sounds like you've been really intentional to think through some of those things. And and I'd even be curious, maybe here's the next question is, since you started with, and is the correct term, do you, do you just call it movement? Do you call it movement culture? Is there is there a certain taxonomy that yeah, when I say this, it means like, yeah, this this is this particular idea and thought. I'm always nervous. I'm yeah, screw it no, up. I I mean, it, I struggle with the same thing. So I would say no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, because you know we can we could chop semantically all the stuff up. Yeah, movement culture is probably um, accurate in terms of an exploration of these different disciplines and concepts. And and the reason I ask, because I imagine like when you first came upon this and I'd be curious how you gravitated towards this yourself, but now you fast forward to at least a decade in doing this. How have you started to deviate from that Hmm. and like, Hey, okay, this is, this is what I think it was when I first approached it. And now I've I've taught enough people, I've done it myself enough that hey, we thought this was what it meant to be a generalist. And mm-hmm. I actually think it might be these things. Mm-hmm. Or, you know what, this one thing that we thought was a part of the the <clears throat> map and the territory, it's actually not as important yeah. as I once thought yeah. it was. Yeah, so I, I that's a great question. I one thing I'll say is this idea of generalist can still then feel like specialty, mm-hmm. right? So like, mm-hmm. because it's in, it's in the context of a, of a container of yeah. something. So the, the overarching generalist is maybe more so rooted in understanding the direction of one's life. So one's being, let's say, or one's becoming in a way. Um, That's good. So from that perspective, then, this is something that Dido talks about, which is this container that we call practice becomes an opportunity for us to establish some sort of bookends on something that is developing us. And that something could be baking bread, making good coffee, whatever it is. But Hope, it, it, hopefully it's bread. Doing yeah. a podcast, you know, we talked about consistency. Uh-huh. So in practice, there is a workable set of rules that allows us to um, shape ourselves under this parameter of being consistent with something and moving towards things that maybe we don't understand or under, understand ourselves within. And so then ideally this, this practice can bleed into life and that then shapes more generality of life and who I am. So what I do in the gym is not separate from what I'm doing at home with my wife or how I'm spending time with family and friends. As far but, as the way that you you think about it, or, or almost yeah, like you said, like, well, the meta skill of it. The, yeah, it's like mm-hmm. um, you know, if I'm develop, let's say if I'm understanding myself in practice and things are changing there, that change is me. So then it goes with me everywhere else. So for example. Maybe I start with an hour practice, and then next thing you know, I'm practicing for four hours. And in that time, I'm fully present. That presence and focus gets carried with me everywhere else. So there's there are capacities that we're often not aware of that are being developed, and we think that it's just the skill. We're like, oh, I developed a handstand, for example. But the reality is what, it was, what was required to develop the handstand actually – has taken me beyond that container of practice into other parts of life. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it becomes a more integrated way to see how these practices can become important for then shaping the quality of other aspects. Um, so, so with that, I would say I didn't realize this originally, but my desire to start working with Ido had been shifting into that seeing that and wanting to understand his perspective it it stemmed from recognizing that um, this idea of quantification didn't really resonate with me because Mm. um, I I had previously done the whole bodybuilding thing I very young uh, in my college life 
I, I 24 seven lived as a bodybuilder and I turned pro as a, I was 22. And I, I didn't know any of I that. Turned, I turned pro early and I was just like, you know what? Like, man, this is empty. Hmm. Um, I got into it on a whim. Someone was like, Hey, you should do this. Yeah. Um, they're like, your, your arms are fantastic. You exactly. Should, yeah. yeah. I was like yeah. working out. I was in high school working out at an old gym in Dallas called Texas gym. And, um, a couple people approached me and were like, Hey, you should do this. I was like, no way I'm getting on stage in a speedo. <laughs> and I ended up doing it and did really well and kept doing it. And I set my size, like, I want to be a pro by the time I'm this age competed, um, up to that time turned professional and then was like, this is, even though I was doing it natural with all the supplements, all the hacks, everything I could mm -hmm. to just get as big as possible naturally, it was empty and it didn't feel healthy to me. And so anyways, I shifted my mindset then to wanting to understand a little bit more of the internal perspective. And so I went from, I could say this quantitative mm. idea to how I approach physicality to a more qualitative idea. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So it started to kind of shape what I did naturally, how I lived my life. Um, and th that kind of blended into, I didn't realize it at the time, but what attracted me to Ido's work originally was the quality of how it was done. Mm -hmm. It's like the details, like, man, there's something detailed about, even with strength work, I'm like, this looks sharp, you know? And um, so I stumbled with it because I found him in 2009 and I didn't start working with him until 2014. And I couldn't I couldn't arrive at the quality, the details, because mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. have them. And so ultimately when I started working with him, it was immediate and it was somewhat understanding what to look for. But I still then went years without fully understanding what it was that was being developed. And it goes back to, again, um, something that I try to offer even at the Movement Standard, which is the development of uh, movement quality could directly affect quantitatively how I move. It's not always the case. You mm -hmm. know, there are certain capacities that are needed. Mm -hmm. But in developing movement quality, what is being developed is my sense of self. Because in order for quality to improve, there has to be an, a sensitivity to what I'm doing. And in order to be sensitive, I have to be looking at myself. And so then that, that looking, it's like a, it's a feedback. It's like every skill becomes an opportunity for me to refine something through internal looking versus external something. And so this is why, like, he'll often talk about this, and I've experienced once you hit that goal, let's say once I get a one-arm handstand or a one-arm chin-up, it's like, okay, what next? Because it doesn't fulfill anything. Mm -hmm. What it ultimately fulfills is this thing that you felt like you needed to understand yourself. And um, so that, mm -hmm. again, starts to shift into more, I would say, of a qualitative approach. Um, and, and changes how then really foundationally how practice is then organized. So instead of like, um, going in and practicing and seeing how much time I can practice, how much weight I can move, how much, how much, how much, how am I doing it? Like how, like what is actually happening here? Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was a big insight for me. It's like, oh man, I've just like really been, arriving at these things that I wanted to, again, approximate. I see someone do it, I wanna do it, mm -hmm. but I didn't really understand what was in between the two. Um, so again, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that is a shift from when I started the practice and thinking that, again, like you saw me kind of when I was doing a lot of gymnastic work, mm -hmm. and a lot of my practice also has followed Ido's own development, because he's developed. You know, he continues to move. Um, and ideally, that's the case for all of us. You mm -hmm. know, we're, we're seeing this kind of transition over time. For me, when I started the practice, it still was rooted in what I was good at, which was strength. Mm -hmm. um, strength has always just come naturally for me, and it's interesting. But what I was really drawn to was the softness. And so I started exploring a lot of spinal work, a lot of this like dance quality type work, floor work, soft acrobatics, 
these things that still don't really come to me naturally, but because I've explored them, it feels like it's balanced to something in a way. Hmm. Um, and so I'm always looking. One of the things that I've noticed is as practice becomes more and more explored, and this is why earlier I said esoteric, because some of the things that you start doing, it's not about trying to find more that needs to be developed, but there's always a looking for deeper and deeper layers. Um, and so some of the things you end up doing, like now I spend maybe an hour, a, hour a day standing. It's like, okay, well, what is standing doing? Um, and developing some of these postural drills. Mm -hmm. Um, this was something that I even thought about recently. Like you said, the most, the most, um, potent movements are likely the ones we can't see. And so this may even be the movement of thought, right? It's like thought is a movement. So those potent movements are not um, shown on Instagram because there's nothing inherent in them that someone might be drawn to. Yeah, I would like to see a, a Instagram post of just you standing. That's, <laughs> that's what I feel like we I need. actually did think about it. <laughs> I actually did think about it. Why not? I mean, totally. At somehow, this point, and, and, it's like who cares? Well, and and, yeah. and also like you and I talked about like these these concepts do need to be shared, um, but out of context, they can be. You know, now it's like um, maybe we're doing standing competitions, mm -hmm. right? Versus like, well, what's ac actually happening there? Yeah. So um, so yeah. Anyways, I, I think the the practice continues to shift, whereas you know. In ten years, maybe I'm not doing handstands anymore. Mm. I mean, that would be that would be I probably ideal if I'm moving along a certain progression. Yeah. So, yeah. This concept that you're talking about, it really is. It has some to do with identity. It has some to do with. I, I don't care about the outcomes. I care about the process. I'm immersed in it. It's bleeding over into not just other areas of my life. It's it's bleeding into this concept of, of who I am. And so the way that I think about attention and progression and practice and the experience, it's nice that it also is influencing other areas of your life, like you said earlier. What do you do when you feel like that thing that I just said somebody hasn't grasped fully? And this is really <clears throat> boring, basic stuff, like they're actually not committing enough time to practice. Or this romantic notion of it, it directing your life, you see you know what, this isn't directing this person's life. They're actually overweight. Mm -hmm. And I can tell that they're not making good choices. And I can tell that they haven't embodied this like, like I've been swept away with myself. How do you handle that? I think it's the, uh, the old, can't, you can only lead a horse to water. Um, so, you know, uh, and for those that haven't heard that, you can't make them drink. Um, so Thank you, you, yeah. you, you yeah, you just, you're there. Um, you show up, and if they show up and they're there, I think a lot of times um, we, uh, this is maybe getting a little bit beyond um, in some ways. It's definitely beyond my understanding, but we, we, we fail to recognize that something else is actually happening. The, the mm -hmm. what that we see on the surface mm -hmm. um is there, let's say someone is not making changes, they're overweight, et cetera, but the reason they keep showing up is actually something else. Mm. So it's not even in their conscious awareness why they're showing up. Mm. So um, we could say this is the difference between the, the knowing that knows, mm -hmm. this idea of awareness or being, and then who they are. Are externally. So, you know, um, 
again, that person, they're there for a reason. And th- it's almost like their internal compass is driving them there. Mm-hmm. But they may not have caught, in, caught up to that understanding. It's something subconscious. Yeah. 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 It could be subconscious. Um, yeah. It could be just related to, again, um, uh, just something that uh, is hard to put a finger on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe one day it's like, it's that old question. Why did, why and when does somebody become aware? Like why, for example, why did it take me five years to start working with Ido or why, even though in the background, I was like, oh, something's interesting here. I'm not sure what it is, but then we make that decision. And oftentimes, at least in my own experience, I find, and this happened with the movement standard as well. I find that decisions we like to think, or I like to think that I made the decision rationally and I went in with full logic and understanding and then split second, it was like, yes, let's do it. But is it really that it was rational and logical or was there something else? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, I do, I do think that if someone keeps showing up, there's something else there. Mm -hmm. Um, and they know, I say they, their being knows um, and it's directing in some ways. Mm-hmm. So this gets into maybe like, you know, um, other conversations, but uh, I, I, I've experienced this in my own way at times, and I've seen it with students as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, just keep talking the talk, walking the walk. Um, and, you know, as Ido talks about slicing and dicing, so I slice it this way, I dice it that way. And it's like if I have, you know, one one argument of growth and understanding that can be beneficial for many, including ourselves, is the ability to put on many hats and, and have multiple perspectives on something. And so if I have 10 different perspectives on how to look at this one thing, then I can slice and dice and share it 10 different ways. Mm. Um, so yeah, and I'm sure you, you recognize this also in the hat of, listen, you're doing a podcast, you run a business, you have a family, you have a, a full gym operation here. Mm-hmm. You're wearing many hats and you've got to like kind of slice and dice things many different ways that, um, that is different than if you went and sat in a lab all day mm-hmm. and like, you know, pushed a Petri dish around. Not that, that you know, there's anything wrong with Not that. Not that there's anything Nothing wrong with, wrong with that. Wrong with no. that. I'm yeah. just saying the outcome of mm-hmm. who you are would be different in those situations. Mm-hmm. Or if you're running a coffee shop, or if you're, it, the scenario could be a million different scenarios, but the fact that like maybe you're wearing 10 hats versus one hat actually challenges you in a different way. Mm. And so um, the same is with then shaping perspective. You have, now many different perspectives. You could, I'm sure, talk to someone about business. You can talk to them about psychology. You could talk to them about, you know. Um, and to me, that also then bleeds into this kind of generalist idea. Whereas, let's say, let's say I am doing something that's more um, allocated to one line of thinking or operating. Maybe, um, you know, maybe I, I'm a car salesperson or, you know, something specific where it's like I'm, I'm doing one channel um, and I've automated that channel. Maybe I need to challenge myself in other ways. Like I'm sure you find other ways to challenge yourself even physically. Now you talked about bike racing mm-hmm. and doing all these other things because it's like brand, continuing to branch out into other areas of exploration and development, I'd mm-hmm. imagine. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you racing bikes now gives you a different perspective to how to run a business maybe, or how to, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't yeah. know if you think about these things, but it's interesting cause it's endless. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things I've always liked in our conversations is not, is not to, um, obsess over the differences, but to see where there's a great overlap. Yeah. It's like, oh man, if if Brian's thinking that and I think that, man, there might be something to yeah, that. No doubt. And just this concept of of expansion feels like adventure to me. And I think that's a really romantic word. And also it's really hard to be a specialist. Oh, no. If doubt. you've ever tried to, yeah, to yeah, really be a specialist, yeah. it means it means you're shooting for world class performance. And that's really hard. So I think even 
a lot of the times where we say like, oh, are you doing bike racing? So that means you're specializing. It's like, no, man, because I'm not, I'm not pursuing it to be the best at it. Yeah. I'm just doing it because I think it's a cool thing to yeah. do. I just like, I was thinking that yesterday. I just like riding my bike. Yeah. That's no it. Doubt. Yeah. And I'm not very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's like that, yeah. the combination of enjoyment, curiosity, and also under no circumstance do I think I'm good at it. I think is like a, to use our friend, the the lab researcher, it's a great Petri dish yeah. uh, uh, to, to think like, hey, that's a great place that I could expand. Right. And after, you know, a long, long time of doing this, I think that's the part that continues, that will be just like progression, right? This thing we're talking about, it's never ending. Like, I won't get to a point, you won't get to a point where it's like, yeah, you know, I guess it's about as wide as the territory can be for right. me. It's always going to be like, oh, I took my eye off of that. Okay, now I got to pivot and go in that direction. And so I think the... I think there's something that has long-term potential there. And then when we're talking about being a specialist versus a generalist, being a specialist is really easy to objectify yourself and say, well, this is who I am. But when you're a generalist, you can't really be that proud of anything you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I'm a proud generalist. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. in a way, in and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's like, hey, this is just something that I do and it's making my whole life better versus, hey, let me reduce who I am down to this one thing. I'm, yeah. I'm a handstander. I'm, I'm an Olympic weightlifter. I'm a bike rider. It's like, well, you can see how culturally we are carved to be specialists, right? It's like, I mean, look at anything like social media from social media to you know opening a space that it's specific to one thing um but you know it has its costs um mm -hmm. and some of that cost could be in our own development um and then yeah it's like uh maybe now i maybe now I'm teaching handstands and that's all I offer, but that's not really what I'm doing. Or I see this all the time. Like, Oh, I, I, I offer this, but this isn't actually what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's interesting to me. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I have to now offer this cause that's what I've always offered. Mm. Um, versus the ability to pivot. I love yeah. pivoting. <laughs> I love pivoting. This it's is why nice. we keep our space small and like, it's like I can pivot next month and be like, hey, guys, we're shifting to this now. Um, it's tough, though, because, again, like we have this thing that is also running a business and keeping consistency and all of that. So it's you're managing. But pivoting is uh, it's nice. Yeah. And when you do that with the guys that you get to work with, how is the response to that? You know, I always I, I try to ask and send out surveys and get ideas from people. Um, it's usually it, it's usually well, well received because like as a whole, uh, other people are feeling the same thing. They're like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. Hmm. Um, and, you know, occasionally if it's not well received, then likely that that whole entire situation wasn't right for that individual to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it kind of filters, um, fil filters people in that way. Um, but yeah, it's nice to be able to just like, Hey, look, this isn't working. Like two months later, we tried this. Let's now switch. There's a lot of, um, you know, I would say too, this is part of practice. It's like ongoing error management. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you know, if I'm failing regularly at skills, which ideally I should be, mm -hmm. um, then I am also regularly managing errors. So it's wow. not that like when I practice, everything That's is good. good. I'm like error, 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 error. And it's through those quote unquote errors that, um, you know, that I can refine, you know, that I can see something. It makes me think of, um, how a plane or even a ship tax, mm -hmm. right? Where like the destination isn't in a straight line, but it's like, constantly recalibrating like where you're at yeah. and as um as guides you know as coaches i mean you're really just trying to to keep those errors you know in a manageable right right <laughs> it's like we don't want too big yeah there are definitely two there's a there's a kind of a 
a bookends type situation. But I would say in error management, the thing that's being developed arguably is the ability to look and be sensitive. And so that's where, again, it goes back to the self-learning because mm-hmm. you're, you're understanding yourself through the error. Um, and yeah, it's like, uh, otherwise I think what happens is in some ways too, and just to kind of go back to this idea of practice, cause this is often what we root down in is like, guys, we're here to practice. Um, there, there can be a separation where it's like, I come into practice quote unquote, and I automate, I'm just like going through the motions mm-hmm. because I feel like I should be doing this. Like I need to work out. Maybe it's based in compulsion. Maybe it's based in some other thing that I've not looked at, and it's separate from the rest of my day. I do my day. I go to the gym. It's an hour, and then I go home. I did that thing, um, and it gets into this whole kind of cycle of not using a practice, a contained practice to actually look at oneself, but to actually remove oneself. Mm. And so how do we integrate? And that integration becomes through this self-looking within again a container of time practice is over and now i can pull out my phone and you know not be fully in the world if i you know choose to be but at least during that time let's say you get on a bike every morning at 7 a.m during that time you're in practice Mm -hmm. so you're managing errors um so it becomes an opportunity for then again i guess you could say working that that it's not a capacity, but working that, that layer. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that way, I, I, I want to say that just because it does in some ways matter what we're practicing, mm-hmm. um, in that the, what that's being practiced is actually the, the observation, the actual, what we are doing may not be as important, but where this can often get lost is people will say, Oh, well, th- I have a practice of being present with everything. And it can't be the case because it's too big. Like I can't, life is a practice, this idea. And Ido talks about this, like life being a practice is too big for me to actually manage errors because there are too many rules, like the other people's rules. There's no, there's no constraint to what the practice actually is. Mm -hmm. So I have to narrow it in to these boundaries to have something to be able to work with. Mm. So that's distinctly different than just doing something for fun. You know, it's like I, my practice doesn't have to be fun um, because I'm not doing it for fun. Fun may be a byproduct of some parts of it, but if I'm also doing things I don't like, then maybe it's not fun in some regards. Yeah, and, and also defining what fun right. is. Um, yeah, not mas- masochistic fun, not that kind of, it's like something, there's something else. It's not like, um, I like to like it or I like to dislike it. It's, there's something else that's, um, organized there that's beyond that surface like and dislike or, um, that, that wheel of like and dislike we could say. How, how would you describe it? Um, that's a great question. I would describe it as um, it feels much more intrinsic. Like mm. there's a maybe an intrinsic reward of some kind. I think it's a big theme of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So there's a there's an intrinsic quality that is not definable, but there is a knowing. It's the best way I could describe that sees that this thing is actually moving, not even moving in a direction, like there's progress, but it's, it's allowing for this thing to emerge that wants to emerge, that wants to show up. Um, and we could call that thing again, learning, we could call it attention, presence, um, awareness, you know, um, I think those things are really fun. Yeah. You know, we have that in common that like learning to me is really fun. If I could orchestrate this environment where that's always present, I'm having a good time and it's not, you know, a hedonic treadmill of just pleasure or enjoyment, but you know, there's something there that feels like you said, very, very intrinsically appealing in context of that. I want to hear what Bo was talking about when he said that you gave some, some bit information on effort, because I think that is in line with what 
yeah. what we're alluding to. Yeah, and again, this is something that was shared recently um, by Ido, and this is also something that I've read quite a bit about and studied quite a bit myself in some of these, like, you know, we could say Eastern traditions, spiritual traditions, as well as some um, Western kind of mysticism. But this idea that, like, um, uh, to bring it to practice and what typically shows up in practice is this idea that in the in, in the presence of effort, there is generally a felt sense of friction. So, you know, if I'm doing something that I don't want to do, it's met with resistance. And that resistance then shows me that there are two opposing something. So there's a part of me, for example, that wants to do it and a part that doesn't. Um, and in that, and it could be a number of different scenarios, but in that resistance, um, there is then an opportunity to look for how the thing is done. And generally, we don't look for this thing. So again, I have a moment. Let's say I'm going to do a specific practice. I don't want to do the practice. I feel the resistance. Or maybe the resistance is there and I don't notice it. So Mm -hmm. there's a couple of different options here. But let's say I go to do this practice and I notice the resistance and it's now immediately it's arduous, effortful. Well, you know, there is something created to get through the work. So it's like you go to do your your barbell, you know, hand clean. And you're like, gosh, not feeling this today. Although maybe that's one of your moves. You're like, man, this is I got this. Mm, mm-hmm. But maybe you're not feeling it today. And um, there's some there's something that you that's generated, let's say, to get the thing done. And generally, that thing is, um, in some ways, mechanical or automated. So we could say that a separate self is created, a separate you. And this is the the you that always shows up when something challenging needs to happen physically. So maybe it involves, you know, you crank up the music or you get angry or um, you, you know, have some sort of external simulation. You drink another cup of coffee all of these things to get us up for the work, ultimately, if automated, have the potential to also numb us because it's not us that are, that's doing the work. It's a separate entity. And over time, what happens is often if I'm doing it from an automated mechanical perspective, that thing continues to numb. It's moving me towards the opposite direction of sensitivity it continues to numb me to the point to where I actually, I got the work done, but I don't either know how I did it or how it was done because I wasn't really there. Um, so the the choice in that friction moment is, am I first conscious of the friction? And then in being conscious, am I choosing to do the work from a conscious place? So I can still actually go through effort and discomfort, but actually choose to go through it, not from a masochistic way, but I can choose to go through it to actually be more aware and more sensitive to what I'm doing. Um, So these two, we could almost think of it as like a tree, where again, if I go one direction and I automate everything I'm doing, through that effort and friction, I'm actually now moving myself further away from the potential of development, of understanding. I'm just, again, I'm going through the motions, which we've all done. I do this all the time, man. I, as Ido talks about, too, he's like, it, um, this idea of a sense of willpower is a trick. And, you know, the fact that, like, we claim to have it is a bit misleading because, at some point, we don't have it. So it's not always there. So it's not truly us. Whereas this thing, this conscious thing, is actually always there. Mm. So I can choose to be aware and go through the work, or I can automate it. And we could say in mechanical automation, that effort then also produces with it other byproducts that are not sustainable. 
So maybe I get injured more often because I'm not aware. I'm not sensing the fact that, hey, I should have stopped five sets ago Mm -hmm. or 50 pounds ago. Um, Maybe it's building tension in the body that's unnecessary. So this whole conversation starts to then get shaped in a way that I have to now undo all of these efforts, these mechanical efforts that were built up over years of automation. Mm -hmm. So um, again, like this is something I see in my own practice. Uh, I like this idea. It's maybe it stems from some Eastern martial arts like Tai Chi, where um, you have this this concept of effortless effort, um, which essentially is what is the right amount of effort for the thing Mm -hmm. it's not to say that effort's not required Mm -hmm. it's just um you know if i'm doing a lift maybe i don't need um this like radiation of tension you know like this neural drive thing where i'm squeezing my face and everything possible to make it happen maybe it's actually the right tension the Mm -hmm. right effort and that then starts to teach me where and how to be even more sensitive still doing crazy lifts, long bike ride, whatever the thing is. But so the activity is still the same, but the outcome ends up being arguably different. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this, this thing of automation also arguably strengthens the separate self. So I'm, you know, when, when, when you talked about specialty, yeah. you know, oftentimes, and this isn't always the case, so I'm not, you know, uh, pointing at anything, but like oftentimes there is something else that's wanting to specialize, right? It's like, I want to show that I'm the best at this thing. And well, it so it feels good to put that on. feels good. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's like, we all love to show what we're good at and to get accolades and whatnot, but Again, there's a way we could argue there's a way of how it's done that is self-strengthening and not in the it's it's separative, mm-hmm. like it's egoic in a way. And then there's a way of doing it that then maybe arguably is um, building sen- sensitivity of self. And so this then brings in the really kind of what we've been talking about this whole conversation. It brings in the the conscious kind of attentive looking um versus the automatic numbing i'll say like when i first started working with ito for example i just like he sent me the work i did it like i didn't there it was like a piece of paper at the time i didn't know what i was doing i used i was like working beyond my capacity in so many ways i was not sensitive i you know broke myself at times and so it took me a lot of that experience going through it to be like, wow, um, there's something there. Mm. <laughs> so that was kind of, again, um, that was kind of the the moment where I, I, I recognized that, man, this is maybe not the best direction long term. And again, the what didn't matter. You could be doing CrossFit. You could be doing... Uh, Pilates, you could be whatever, how you're doing it is then the most important part. Hmm. So I'm not sure how that sits or if it resonates, (laughs) but (laughs) we were, we were going to just go an hour, but we're going to have to go three hours now. (laughs) Uh, Where do I begin? I think you're spot on. I'm, I'm going to use different terms, but you and I, there'll be a Rosetta Stone here with what you said. And, and a lot of what I think is that, and maybe this is a more, you know, Western diction, but I, I think that we tell ourselves we have to have willpower. We have to be motivated. I think a lot of that comes from fear. I know it has for me. And uh, initially early on, it was athletically. It was like, Hey, I, I want to rise to the occasion. I'm not feeling it. And so I have to create this sympathetic nervous response in me. And here's the problem. It's really effective. You know, you said automatic, but weaponizing yourself and telling yourself that you're a piece of shit and turning on rage against the machine and, you know, taking caffeine, like it works until it doesn't. 
And the thing that I agree with you, that it is automatic, that because it works, your subconscious, whatever, you know, we want to call it, starts to evoke that more and more and more until you have this personality, you have this voice, you have this part of yourself that takes over, takes control. Yeah. And I've seen that happen to me athletically where it's like, oh, every single time there would be this narrative and this dialogue and this conversation inside my head. But here's where it becomes even more insidious as one business owner to the other, because it's a lonely road, that voice would start to creep in for that. Mm. Hey, mm -hmm. nobody's telling you that you got to do this stuff business-wise, and lo and behold, that same voice would mm. show up, and mm -hmm. it would talk to me in the same way like I was doing a squat clean or whatever. Yeah. And it became this thing that permeated throughout everything I was doing. It would start to show up automatically as a father and as a husband mm. and as mm -hmm. a brother and as a son and all of these things that started from something that was actually for good. Yeah. And it became something that, that created a huge shadow in my life and, and automatically, to use your word, showed up in ways that I, I could have never anticipated 20 years ago mm -hmm. when that started, when that started happening. Yeah. It's, uh, I would say, you know, aside from that, it, we, we all inherently have this innate drive towards becoming. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to look mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's this whole idea of becoming versus being, mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, then culturally becoming is put on a pedestal. What are you going to become? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we heard this as kids, like, you know, what, what is, what is this thing? Like it, people are interested, like what your major is in college and like, what are you studying? Well, what are you going to do when you grow? And everything becomes externalized, mm -hmm. right? And so the external becoming gets then the thing that we also attribute to success. And so if it takes rage against the machine, a cup of coffee, et cetera, <laughs> that's actually my tool now. Yeah. Anytime I want to be successful. Mm -hmm. So whether it's with a business, with my workout, with my family, whatever, that's now it becomes a crutch. That's what I have to use in order to get going. Yeah. Um, and so then, yeah, then the question starts to arise, this inquiry of like, well, wh what is it that maybe actually is already there, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't require this thing? Yeah. And some of the things I, I was thinking this only by myself, so this may not make sense, but talking about Western versus Eastern and what you said, it's like, Hey, who are you going to become? It's almost like if we were to use an art metaphor, a very Western way of thinking of art, it's like, hey, we have this blank canvas and the more paint you put on the canvas, the more things you go and do, the more accolades, the more accomplishments, the more, the more beautiful that piece of art is. But then you go to Eastern art and they take a, a block of jade and they remove mm -hmm. everything from that block to to leave you with just the essence of what the artist thought that right. that should be. And maybe that's a good analogy of, of this thing we're talking about. It's not, it's not, Hey, can you put on these, these identities of accomplishment and specialization, but can you start to strip it away to just, um, man, this person that's just doing something without any fear of judgment, without any fear to perform, to be successful, whatever the attachment is. And so the alternative to that that you're saying with, with sensitivity is humility, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this, it's this openness to new learning. Yeah. It's this, uh, like you said when you were early on in your practice, this accurate assessment of where you are because if you really do that then you know like hey this is this is too much yep. for me today yeah and i think deep deep deeply intertwined to that is this fear of not like being good enough at times yeah. and that's why we weaponize and we and we 
automate and we yeah. go to these places because they're like, man, I have to do that. But stripping it away to just who we are and being totally cool, just being in the moment and looking like a yeah. a fool at yeah. times. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's an element of that too that is related to being a nobody. It's like, I mean, look at like social media, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on there, like I'm doing my thing. Like, um, you know, I started sharing early my practice and then that kind of had its, it takes on its own image, its mm-hmm. own life. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're all, I will say my, myself, like, you know, there, there's this arc of a fear of being a nobody. We also, I'll say we, I'll say I, there's a fear of being alone. Mm-hmm. So there, there are these things that shape our desire to become. And I think also we're roughly the same age. We've had some experiences that are similar running businesses, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. seen some things. So (laughs) I think it's actually a natural arc of life to become and then to peel away. Yeah. It's an opportunity. It doesn't always happen, but the opportunity is I accumulate and then I refine. And that refining, like you said, in Eastern art, the peeling away, there's this essence that's left. Mm -hmm. And the essence is the essential nature of what we are. And we have to, I think, maybe go through all of the becoming and continue to also work with that because it'll continue to show up, I'm sure, and then strip away to the bare essence of what is. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's... I, I would say, like, to encapsulate what mo- a movement practice is, that's what we're attempting to do. What is the essence, the distillation of these different practices to allow for this thing to emerge? Um, and that emergence could be individuation or differentiation, but not from the level of what I've become, from the level of what I've let go of. Because we could say again, like, you kind of just pointed to this when I strip away this thing that is actually maybe arguably it's equally me, but more it's mm-hmm. from a deeper place starts to shine. Mm-hmm. And um, there is no need for a character. There's no need for this thing, this extra. It just, it is. Yeah. But it's also scary. <laughs> it's scary, yeah. you know, because it's not, again, it's not culturally what is um, put forth. So this is, this is not stuff that like gets supported. It's like, no, become, become, make more money, accumulate more things, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. It's like uh, <laughs> being a nobody is so good, but it's like you're, we're just here to get it right, not to be seen as being right. Yeah. Yeah. I struggle with that. Oh, me too, man. <laughs> and, and like you said, it's probably a place to uh, arrive where – you know, I've been a, a zealot of CrossFit or, you know, you were a, yeah. um, a pro bodybuilder and you have these things where it's like, you know, what? it's not, I tried this on, it's actually not a great fit. Yeah. Or, hey, I actually have been seen as um, somebody that knows the thing, but when I strip that away and I, I don't objectify myself as that being who I am, like it's much more, it's much more enjoyable yeah. to to be a generalist and to do these things. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. Some of the, some of the Eastern stuff that often explores that they talk about this idea of neti neti, not this, not that. So the stripping away mm. becomes this recognition that all of those things that I had built up, I'm actually not those things. And so I peel the layers back and ideally, um, again, the handstand is not what the handstand is. Mm. Like it shows up as this image but the distillation of what is after I peel it back is something different. Mm-hmm. And part of the journey is understanding or looking to what that that potentially is. Yeah. Yeah. Neti neti. Neti neti. Any T I not this, not that. Not this, not that. And maybe the uh the Dallas version is I'm good and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, thank you so much for the conversation. Uh, this is Brian Johnson, by the way. <laughs> he <laughs> he runs an awesome business uh, here in town. The website is what? Movementstandard.com. Movementstandard.com. Yeah. If I was watching this conversation, I'd want to go um, – investigate and learn more and obviously you have like a uh, a bricks and mortar location and there's um 
things you're doing in person, but you said right before we started um, recording that there's also some online things that you're just getting into. Yeah, some some basic uh, tiptoeing into understanding some of the initial layers to physical practice. And again, we're picking our idea of what some of these foundations might be, but it's not it's like, look, if I go to a, if I go to do a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class, the foundations are going to be different. Mm-hmm. So we have an attempt for people interested in this perspective and attempt at, hey, here's some things to maybe explore before you just jump into all of it. Cool. So yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, man. This for is being yeah, on here. This is great, man. We need to do this more often. This is fun.